go. I'm the uh, founder of MindFit. Um, so it's a company that uh, works with people who are feeling a bit stuck and are um, in survival mode. Um, and I, I, basically it says what it does. It get, helps people to get mentally fitter and stronger and healthier through educating them and teaching them um, how to literally change their mind and how to think differently and how to change their perception to, to change their reality, but really how to be more free to choose how they think and feel and behave, um, getting out of all the neurosis and you know, really um, not just reducing anxiety and depression and anger and guilt and all those emotional disturbances, but but not um, helping them to not create them in the first place. So mm. through through you know, a lot of Buddhist philosophy and Stoic philosophy and you know just ancient shit from some pretty woke dudes that have existed <laughs> over the course of humanity and uh, just sharing that wisdom with them, you know, just helping people to understand that um, the cause and effect. So I've had MindFit for two years now. Prior to that, um, it was called State of Mind Health. So I was just a psychotherapist, basically, a counsellor, helping people to get out of their suffering. Um, but then I realised oh, in helping them to get out of their suffering, I was enabling them to go back into it later on. You know, so they'd, they'd come back in three months or six months because they didn't change the way that they managed yes. you know, life as it happened, as it happens to all of us. So it was a really important shift for me personally and, and for my business. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've been doing this for 10 years. Um, prior to that, uh, yeah, I was in the military. Um, I've been in hospitality management. I've been a lifeguard. I've been a disability employment consultant. Um, and all of those things have given me, you know, a lot a little tool or a resource to use in what I'm doing now. So hospitality was great for building rapport with clients. Mm. Um, um, the military gave me life experience, which we'll, we'll talk about soon. Um, and uh, yeah, the lifeguarding was interesting. I didn't do it for long, but it's still a massive takeaway from that was you know, I went to help someone in my first rescue and, and mm. they were in survival mode. They were in panic. They were in fight flight, you know, severely and being I don't know um, being my first time really I, I went and went to grab them and they didn't even see me as a person they just saw me as a way out so they grabbed me and started pulling me in wow. and so I've had to I've had to punch this dude and thank fuck it was before like so, social media and you know, someone was filming it and putting up <laughs> lifeguard punches drowning man <laughs> yeah but yeah you know, I had to I had to learn well, I did learn that I can't help people until they're willing to help themselves. Sometimes mm. you've got to let people drown. Sometimes you've got to let them hit rock bottom. Um, and and funnily enough, uh, you know, eight years after I left the army, I, I hit my rock bottom. So, yeah, that's that's sort of me in a nutshell. Um, that's a, that's a that's a very deep um, nutshell, mate. I like it. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> you're very you're very right when you say that. Sometimes people need to fall. That's an interesting movement, I think, going on in the world right now that I'd love for you to extrapolate on. Everyone's becoming more interested in inner you know, child work and traumatic, you know, child, you know, seeing trauma as a subjective thing and how can we go back to, you know, prevent and all that sort of stuff, which I think is brilliant. But, and I don't know the answer to this, so I'd really love your opinion on it. But one of the things that happens to people by the end of all of that work is they can look back on it and really love it because it just gave their life so much more meaning, you know, coming through the challenging and all that sort of stuff. So how do you draw the line between like preventative mechanisms and also helping people move through it? I struggled with that exact question when I was launching MindFit. I was yeah. like in this real conundrum of, I wouldn't be who I am today without all of my trauma. So how how could I prevent people from going through that? You know, but then I realised life's going to happen to all of us to some degree, 
and we're all on our own journey. It depends what you believe in. This incarnation of me, you know, um, had to go through all those experiences. But, you know, you ask the Buddha. He's, he's trying to teach people to, to stop feeling suffering mm. um, uh, through coming enlightened. So uh, I love, what was it? Seneca said, if, if you believe you have been harmed, then you have been harmed. So your mind is complicit in your suffering. Mm. And so it's a very subjective thing, as you said. So uh, the answer, in a nutshell, I don't know. Um, I, I, my, what I've landed on is that people have, have got years of trauma behind them. So I'm going to free them from that and, and help them to free themselves from that. And they're going to have hopefully years of life experiences ahead of them. So I'm going to empower them and, and guide them uh, on how to not experience suffering to the degree that they have in the past and, and to find the value in all of that, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. And I think um, it's an unfortunate consideration, the idea that we can't necessarily um, not have some kind of pain in life. Well, it's, it's a utopian belief. Like yeah. you know, the, the, the first of the noble truths to live is to suffer. As, as soon as we have choice, we suffer. We go to the milk bar. Oh, do I want a chocolate or strawberry milk? We're in suffering. We're in anxiety. You know? So we can't, av- I don't want to say we can't avoid suffering, but we can learn how to reduce our suffering and to not get stuck in our suffering. And I think that's what the real impact of trauma is 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 the people get stuck in it and Mm. they continue to be debilitated by it um my military experience you know i that was 18 years ago and i've really had to do a lot of work just within myself around accepting that whilst i have forgiven those that violated me and 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 i um i feel free of that experience emotionally the reality is that it 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 forged me at um at you know i got discharged with anxiety and depression ptsd alcohol um disorder Mm. dependency disorder and uh it's you know all of those things when when my anxiety would get triggered it would be months at a time i'd be in this i'd be in this neurosis for months at a time now it's just moments mm. you know but um i've i've still been i can't find the right word for it um i had it earlier it's it's you're still affected you're still forged it's still it doesn't define me but it it still has it's like a, a sapling tree. You know, you go and you carve your initials into it when it's, and it's going to grow up and it's still going to have your initials in it. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, it's still a part of my, my life path, I suppose. You mean that and, like, and I, I, I hate how I hated how it affected me. I hated how it affect my relationships and affect me not leaving the house. And I, I was really angry for a long time at, you know, I've, I've done the work of, of forgiven yeah. and I've accepted. Why am I still angry? And I hadn't accepted deep enough that um, it, it is still a part of who I am. Yeah. Do you mind going into detail with, with what you're talking about specifically? Like, so how did you come to the military and, and what happened from there? Yeah. So I, I was a bit of a mm, loose unit as a kid, I suppose you could best describe it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I stole my sister's car when I was 16 and class clown. We moved around a lot as a kid and I was very insecure. I had no um, no self-esteem or self-worth or anything. So I was stealing shit to give to people to sort of buy their friendship and all that stuff. Um, and luckily my sister's boyfriend had a friend who he and I connected and he was a couple of years older and he sort of, I don't know, it felt like he understood me and he, he didn't judge me. Um, he could see that I'd lost my way a bit. And so he got me working for him and, and, you know, he was just a really good role model. And he, um, he said, why don't we, he was in the army reserves and he said, why don't, why don't you join the army? Why don't we join the army together? Mm. And I was like, yeah, cool. And he said, oh, I've got my business. I've got to wrap that up. Why don't you join the reserves first? Um, and, and I'm like, yep, cool. So I went off and did 13 weeks boot camp and 
came back and right, I'm an infantry soldier. Blah, just gonna blow <laughs> shit up and shoot some guns and and then <laughs> yeah. um, before we could both join the regular army, he he got cleaned up on his motorbike and died. Oh wow! So I'd I'd made a promise to him, uh, and so I I it was one of those sliding door moments, I guess, in life. Um, and so I followed through with that promise. So, yeah, off I went to, to basic training again, this time to become a reconnaissance soldier um, in Armoured Corps. I got posted up to Darwin, um, driving light armoured vehicles. And I loved it. I was super fit. I loved running. I loved, I ran for the army um, in the Defence Force games. Mm. Um, I was, you know, just loving it. I, I, I sort of didn't quite fit in because I was a bit of a, different thinker i didn't have that pack mentality but yep. um but still i still love my job and had great friends woo, woo, woo. and then um we uh we were, we were, east team all started kicking off so we were based in darwin um so we we're going to be the first unit to deploy so we were training we we're on 24 hours notice to move and then i, I blew my knee out oh, wow. um fell in a hole twisted the knee uh, ripped all the ligaments and everything yeah and uh, yes, yeah, so I was having a bit of a, a pity party because uh, all my mates shipped off, and and I, you know, I lost um, my capacity to run, so I lost my passion, um, and I lost my job. I couldn't do my job anymore. I couldn't climb up on vehicles. I couldn't do anything. Oh, I was like yeah, a knee yeah. brace for th- knee brace for three months. You know, um, and once it was funny. Once you once you can't do your job in the army. I don't know what it's like now, but back in my day, you're sort of seen as you're thrown on the scrap heap and treated like shit. So I started getting charged for really stupid stuff, and you know, they just just you become an easy target, I suppose. Right. Um, so I lost a lot of friends because I didn't want to get tarred with the same brush. They all disappeared. Uh, my family was across the other side of the country. So you know, all the things that I'd relied on to make me happy. Uh, have suddenly in one foul swoop disappeared and I realised that my reliance on them, my codependency on them for my happiness um, was very unhealthy and I didn't realise at the time. So when they fell over, I fell over. And and they probably, so that was all happening, you know, under the surface. But then I went back to work in some capacity um you know i I got off the crutches got rid of the knee brace i still i was still rehabbing my knee i still couldn't do my my normal duties but i got linked back in with my squad uh and then i was walking down to the compound one day and about seven or eight dudes just grabbed me um and uh, they're just bored it was you know there's so much boredom in the army and once again being an easy target they grabbed me and they stripped me naked um, and they zip tied me spread eagle to a wire cage um, and then got the fire hose out and a couple of whip antennas off the vehicles and uh, yeah it's been about oh, I can't remember five ten minutes um, just you know amusing themselves basically and I think the the hardest part of that was um, the the breaking in the trust of these these blokes that I trust and I worked with, you know, I, I remember when they grabbed me, I started trying to fight them and wrestle them, and and the same, many of them was just pointless, you know, and 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 that moment where you realise you're helpless, it, it scars you really badly. Um, mm. So so yeah, so that that was probably a major emotional trauma and and i'd had a pretty major physical trauma that came with some minor emotional traumas as well so you know all that compounded uh so i got medically discharged and i hope with anxiety and depression and a knee issue and i wasn't linked into any psych services or anything there's no counseling they they sent me off to learn how to make a coffee uh, <laughs> god and said, and said that'll well, help <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the doctor that signed off on my discharge said, I'm going to make sure a malingering cunt like you never gets back in this man's army. That was, that was the parting words. It, it was weird. It was like it was like they thought I did it intentionally or I did it on purpose or something. And um, 
yeah, that was weird. That night when I got out, I went to the pub and all these dudes came up to me and were like, oh, Southern, mate, we're so sorry, you know, sorry we couldn't hang around you, you know, that you could buy you a beer. So, so, so I got wow. out, all these mates came back and, um, yeah, it was just a yeah, – and I'm 22 years old. This is 18 years ago. Mm. So I, I uh, didn't have any tools. I didn't have any resources to, to self-manage and to go, this isn't personal. This isn't about me. This is more about them. I didn't know what I know now. Um, so I didn't know that I, ha- I had mental health. Um, I didn't know that I was responsible for my mental health and well-being. Um, so I just drank for eight years pretty much and partied and left a trail of broken relationships because I closed my heart off. Um, and, and that wasn't reopened till the start of this year by a woman who just came along and magically went ding and oh, I have the key. And, and I, was wow. like, I was like, what the fuck's going on here? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm seeing unicorns and rainbows and love hearts and glitter and <laughs> all this shit. <laughs> um, but prior to that, no woman stood a chance because I was, I was emotionally retarded in a very wow. literal sense. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it was you know, 22 year old Nick it turned into a 30 year old Nick, and the, the mental health deteriorated into mental health issues. And because they were left unattended to and masked with alcohol, um, they then turned into mental illnesses and um, you know, agoraphobia, suicidal thoughts, and um, major depressive disorder and severe anxiety and on all these things. So, yeah, there, there came a point where, as I said, I was standing at my door and, and I just thought, fuck, there's, there's got to be another way. So, it's, um, yeah. yeah, took the hard path, basically. Yeah. Went to the, went to, went to the school of life. <laughs> Mate, yeah, so I think one of the questions that I wanted to ask you is, like, there are – moments like that that happen in people's lives where they hit that rock bottom and there are a lot of people out there that choose not to live on and then they just that's the end of them you know and it's unfortunate that like we have to go down to those bottoms where it's like we're really faced with the true thought of like i'm in so much pain so much suffering i can't get out of this like why live on how did like what was your rock bottom and then like why did you decide to do the work and, and, you know, um, continue on. Um, yeah, it was just that, it was that epiphany. Like it was, there was, there was that much darkness, that much pain, um, anger, frustration, anxiety, depression, guilt, shame, all of these things just coursing through my being. And then I don't, know why you know i've spoken to a lot of different people and they're like it's your life purpose you put it here for this reason it's you know it's just what you're meant to do this epiphany just struck me out of nowhere and it was that it was that thought of my god it was like time stood still from it and i've got my hand on the door handle and i literally i'm a 30 year old man and i can't open a door uh, i just it was i think it was so irrational that it just cut through everything and just hit me between the eyes. I was like, this doesn't make sense. Mm. You know, you're a 30 year old male with arms that work. The door's not locked. It's not boarded up or anything. All you have to do is just turn it you know, 90 degrees and it'll open. But I, I couldn't do it. My, the anxiety was protecting me. It was like a massive bodyguard that had wrapped its arms around me. I was like, nope, we are not going out there. It's too dangerous. And I thought, how fucking brilliant. Like, what what an amazing part of me. Um, and in the sense that it's protecting me, but it's it's not <laughs> helping me. It's not helpful. You know, I'd love to go on a date. I'd love to go and catch up yeah. with my mates. I'd love to go to work. Um, so, but it, it didn't do that. It, was, it, it didn't take any of that into account. So, yeah, having that moment where, if my mind has deteriorated to, to this end of the spectrum, you know, what's it capable of the other end? What, what, what if I put some time and effort and some energy into it? And I looked at my mind like a muscle that I hadn't wow. used ever. And I went, well, I can't expect this muscle to be able to operate if I'm not exercising it. 
and if I'm not training it and if I'm not conditioning it. Um, so yeah, it, it sort of created a gap and I fucking raced out that gap before I could think too much about it and uh, found a psychologist just down the road and she was CBT trained so and, and CBT you know, thankfully resonated with me and I spent about 12 months with her mm. um, and and that I got to just break myself down. You spoke about it earlier. And I think people are really afraid to have an aversion to breaking down. But it's it's the best thing we can do. It's, you've got to let go and let all the, just let it fucking fall, you know. And so I spent 12 months deconstructing and then reconstructing of a version of me that, you know, didn't need all this scaffolding on the outside to support me. I didn't need to be able to run. I didn't need my family. I didn't need my mates and all this, I didn't, I wasn't codependent on all of these X, Y, Z to make me happy. Suddenly I had this foundation that had A, B and C in place and I could just be happy. Uh, and then when these things come along, oh, they make me happier, but they're not the source of my happiness. Mm. Uh, if, if that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. It, like it, it sounds like, you know, to very dismissively sum it up that you, like who you were became enough. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I found um, by turning my, my mind was was ninety five percent irrational and just so distorted. These cognitive distortions were bending and twisting. My mind was my mind was out of shape. Mm. You know, physically, people turn up and go to the gym because they're physically out of shape. Um, you know, metaphorically, I was a hundred kilos overweight. Um, that's how out of shape my mind was. So you know, I spent 12 months exercising, exercising, getting myself back into shape. So when I left, I I was um, yeah, I was in shape, but my mind was rational. It was calm. My my emotions weren't like like a tsunami. It was like a, a calm pond with some ripples in it. The equanimity mm. was was there. And um, I could remain calm and composed and grounded and present and at peace and feel content. All these feelings could now come into play instead of anxiety, guilt, depression, shame, anger, frustration. Um, these these new emotions were there and they, they felt really good. Um, and, but they were there because my mind had changed so significantly. You know, the neuroplasticity had kicked in and, and I uh, it was in creating different chemicals, which was you know, creating different you know, um, pathways in my mind. Yeah. That, it, it's, um, it's a funny thing to talk about like deconstructing and the reconstructing because, and then you mentioned it before as well, you know, we're so afraid to do the deconstructing, but it's also, you know, it's a, it's a mental breakdown or a, or a mental breakthrough, depending on which way you look at it. And I think you get to a point where you can't open the door and you're like, wow, I can't go any lower than this, apart from obviously, you know, ending your life. The, the only way to go is up now. And um, when you reach the end point of the restructuring, how does to finally let go of the past, how does, um, you know, looking back on what happened to you and, and accepting that what they did to you was, was their stuff. Like, how do you go to, to move through all of that? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll look back now when I have to, my mind isn't, my mind isn't dragged back into it. You know, um, when I consciously choose to look back and to talk about my past experience, um, because there's no attachments there anymore to, to what should have happened, you know? Um, so letting, letting go uh, and letting go of all those desires uh, to what I think should have happened or the aversions to what did happen, all these attachments were, were the source of my suffering, was the source of my mind being so out of shape. So letting go and losing those attachments, um, I look back at it now and I can see it through a different lens and a different filter and, and I say, I say to people, I love everything that's happened in my life. I didn't love it at the time. You never like it when you're going through it. You know, you go to the gym and you're lifting, you know, 40 kilo bicep curls. It sucks and you hate it. You're like, ah, but it always feels better afterwards. Um, 
so yeah, that's what the 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 motto for MindFit now is that discomfort precedes success. You've got to go through the shitty stuff to you can't have the dog without the dog shit. It's as simple as that, you know. You can't you can't just want the good stuff without the bad stuff. It's it's all part and parcel. Uh, and and I'm that now. I'm still yin and yang. I'm still positive and no, I'm not positive and negative. I'm, I'm still I'm still a human, and I still have disturbances. Um, I still get triggered from time to time. My anxiety still kicks in, and hey, what's going on? And feel still still feel a bit insecure, and still feel a bit down sometimes. But um, being free of that those attachments makes me free of those pasts, so my memory doesn't play and and my imagination doesn't kick in and and worry about the future you know that there is no past or future anymore there's just the presence and that's where i spend most of my time now Mm, mm. yeah absolutely and you know you said before as well thinking about you know or the, the mind telling you what you wish could have happened i can only imagine like you know being in a state of helplessness and having had had something happened to you not not even to mention the knee and, and all that sort of stuff um and and your friend dying like that's massive you know yeah. and um i just imagine like the attachments would have been fear and shame and all these things but also like anger and like these scenarios of just like beating them up and things i don't know was that was that pertinent or? no well they they fear and shame aren't the attachments the attachments are thinking it should or shouldn't have happened or looking at it in black and white or it's mm. good or it's bad or okay. you know so we've got these cognitive distortions that create the emotional disturbances um and so the emotional disturbances the four main ones are uh, anxiety depression guilt and sh- uh, guilt and anger so i was <laughs> it's funny um you know there's this list of cognitive distortions and they create the disturbances, the feelings, they create a chemical storm. And I kept bouncing back and forth from them. So this shouldn't have happened. So I'd get angry and I'd go back to um, taking it personally and then I'd feel guilty. And then I'd go back to, um, oh, I'm such a terrible person. And then I'd go into more guilt and I'd, I'd just run this loop through my head. It was just compounding, compounding and deepening and deepening and just this, this constant stream of destructive thinking. It was like a, a river of destructive thoughts. And, and I, I was just getting smashed by every wave and hitting every rapid on the way down. And yeah, it, it sucked. <laughs> God, yeah. I was never, I was never, I never, I'm not an, ang- I'm not a violent person. So I never, I, I'm the kind of, my nature is, is not to be angry and, and blow up and go out, external and be, have really loud emotions on more quiet and internal um so you know we all we all react differently to the same experience i suppose if if 10 of us experience what i experienced we'd all have a very different outcome um and, and be shaped differently by it so yeah for me it was it was just you know I, I didn't want to shoot anyone or kill anyone or or anything like that. It was just uh, I was just really sad. I was mm. uh, I'm an empath as well, so you know I feel things very deeply. Um, so I was I was deeply hurt and deeply saddened um, because I did take it personally and I did think it shouldn't have happened and went into all of these you know, unhelpful thinking styles that I didn't even know existed until years later. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so what was your deconstructing then reconstructing process like? Cause you mentioned that Buddhist philosophy and stoicism are, are very deep in, you know, your practice. Like were you reading books as well as doing the, the psychology? What, like what was going on? I had no idea um, actually until years later that, that cognitive behavior therapy is based in Buddhism and stoicism and, and shortly after I, I finished my reconstruction, um, without even knowing it, I wrote this little story called The Accidental Buddhist. And because I, I started, I started coming into contact with Buddhist philosophy, and, and I was like, ah, oh, that resonates. Oh, that's what I do. Oh, that's you know, I take that approach. Or, um, so I knew all this stuff without knowing it. And you know, listening to Ram Dust over the last couple of days is like, um, you know everything that I know, um, because when I say it, you start nodding, and I'm like, that's what I was, that's what I was doing, 
you know. I just didn't consciously know it. And so I'd go and I'd go and study and learn a new modality or whatever, and they'd talk about something. I, but in a framework, I'm like, I've been doing that for years, but I just didn't know what it was called. Or, yeah. Um, you know, so it was. So then, then because it resonated with me, I started seeking it a bit more actively and, and searching for Buddhism. And you know, I went to Bhutan and and I went to some Buddhist countries and travelled. I went and did a Vipassana, mm. ten day silent meditation retreats. And um, yeah, so it just made sense to me. It wasn't the latest science or the latest psychology or what anyone thinks it, it's it's shit that's existed for two and a half thousand years and it hasn't been cracked you can't it's it's so like the source of all pain is attachment you, you can't break that you can't crack that the, the law of nature everything's impermanent you can't you can't argue against that so that's what i'm doing with mind feed is just doing you know giving people access to logic and rationality and common sense um, and helping them to then absorb it into their irrational minds and illogical minds and to change the beliefs that are driving those thoughts that are creating those shitty feelings that are then creating those behaviors that they're not happy with. So mm. it's mm. just, I mean, it, it works for me and it works for my clients. It's, I'm not saying it's the way or the right way, but, um, it's, it seems to be very effective and people are really enjoying it. So yeah, I love what you said, that, that idea that, um, you know, this kind of wisdom has been around for two and a half thousand years. It's like, it's not going anywhere. Why has it stood the test of time? Because it's true that, that I, I couldn't agree more with it. You know, attachment is the root of suffering. The more attached to things and ideas and people and symbols, the more suffering it's going to engender your life. And, 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 and I think an important thing to recognize as well is, similar to what you said at the beginning of this podcast before we were um, recording actually is like what you're doing now, the whole less is more idea of, you know, inch wide and, and, and a mile mm. deep um, mm. recognizing that even that inch in of itself, whatever you're working on, there's going to be suffering in there because you're attached to this idea of who you want to become and the work you want to do. But because it's meaningful for you, it's like, it's the suffering that you consciously decide to, to take on. That's hilarious. I'm, I'm the worst businessman. I, yeah. I don't do marketing. I, I hate marketing. I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible, mate. I'm fucking terrible. But yeah. um, my business seems to be successful because it's so organic in its nature. And because I'm not trying to force it, I'm not trying to touch on people's pain points. I'm coming at it from a really compassionate place. Um, I'm not, I don't chase their money. I don't, you know, it's some people I forget that they have or haven't paid me. You know, it's, <laughs> I'm a nightmare. My bookkeeper hates me. <laughs> um, uh, but I love it because it's, it's just so organic. And a lot of my clients now we're, we're creating a advocacy branch of MindFit because they want to go out and help other people. And, and a couple of them want to do what I'm doing. So we're creating a practitioner course and, um, yeah, I, I don't sit there and go, right, this is my five-year plan. This is what I want to happen. This is what I'm attached to. This is the desired outcome I'm looking for. This is how much money I want to accumulate. I'm just mm. like, fucking every morning I wake up and I'm just like, I wonder what today's going to bring. Mm. And then I just sit back and laugh at how hilarious it all is because, you know, it is. We, we cannot control anything except how we feel. And, you know, this this keeps cutting out and we just keep laughing <laughs> That's about true. it. That's well, true. And why not? Why why not? Why go into a disturbance? Because, you know, as as I talk about on, on the Woke Blokes podcast with Hass, it's these three root causes. I'll tell you a story about this. Um, uh, oh, I'll tell you the story first. Please, so I'm, please. I'm, I'm, I'm going off to do a cognitive behaviour therapy course, advanced course, and there's, there's this psychologist, you know, professor... Love it. <laughs> world, world, world famous. He's come over from the States and he, he's, and so I rock up, it's a four day intensive course and I walk in and there's the psychologists and, and occupational therapists and there's doctorates and degrees and shit everywhere. And then yeah. somehow, somehow I'm in the room. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're all sort of standing around talking and then all you hear is this little gravelly, 
all right, everyone sit down. <laughs> and, you know, it must have hit my military brain or something because I've jumped and, sir, yes, sir, and I've sat down and um, everyone's taking their time and I'm up the back. And as everyone sits down, uh, this this man unfolds in front of me. He's about four foot seven, <laughs> grey hair, like Einstein hair all over the shop. He's a mess <laughs> and he's just... He's old and he's got no filter. He doesn't give any fucks. And he's just like, <laughs> everyone sort of settles down. And he's just staring intently at us all. And he's like, <laughs> his first words when everyone sat down was, you're all ignorance. And I don't know what it hit in my brain, but I'm like, oh, and I'm like, like, it was like New Year's Eve going off in my head. And he's like, you're all incompetent. And I'm just like, turn into a black woman in church and, like, yeah. oh, praise yeah. Jesus. and I'm looking around the room to nudge people and how good's this guy and and I, I noticed everyone was going to suffering mm. everyone was oh everyone was was being hurt and he finishes off with this you're all mediocre <laughs> and I'm just like sign me up where do I I'm coming to live with you I want more of this and uh, I, I didn't understand it at the time and and it wasn't until I was riding my motorbike home four days later where it sort of struck me was what I heard that I didn't see I don't think anybody mm. else heard and that doesn't make me better or mm -hmm. worse or anything. right time just, just yeah just different um, I heard this hidden asterisk to a degree so you're all incompetent you're all mediocre you're all ignorant to a degree mm. and then a double asterisk and that's okay and so and and that that was that was truth hitting my brain that's why my brain started lighting up and and the work that i do I, I talk to my clients about these three core toxic beliefs that fuck us right up completely uh is that we must uh, you know, i must be loved and i must be perfect and i must get what i want and those three beliefs are so irrational because no one ever gets what they want. No one ever um, is loved by everyone and there's no such thing as perfect. Um, so, and they create those cognitive distortions that create the emotional disturbances and they create the behavior and so on and so forth. And I realized the work I'd done years ago, I got rid of those three beliefs to a very large degree. It's human nature to think these things. So they're mm -hmm. still in me. Mm -hmm. you know? Um, I, I can still have a bit of a sulk when I don't get what I want or whatever, but um, but by and large, I don't operate from that space anymore. And and what also lit my mind up was this this resonating uh, like his words that that truth. I I, I just I, I went this is this is truth and this truth exists within me. It was it was like hearing it for the first time, but knowing it for a long time if that makes sense mm. you know, I, I was operating off it i just never heard it said in that way so we are all ignorance none of us mm. know everything we are all incompetent none of us can do everything and we are all mediocre I, i'm i'm great at this but you're great at that you know and, and that's the beauty of the world and it takes all kinds so um yeah coming coming from that place it was so helpful both to me personally and to my clients and all the work I do, uh, all the courses I study and everything, I, I do it first and foremost for myself. Um, and then I'll pull it all apart and pick out all the nuggets that I like and then put it back together and, and put it in a way that I can then deliver it to clients. But I, I, I don't go and do how to earn $100,000 a year or how to do this. I'm not interested in any of that stuff. It's... That's my my. I am an extension of my business. So the more I can evolve and develop and grow and seek more truth, the more I can then pass on through through my programs. Mm, mm. That's yeah. That, uh, that's such a great point, man. We do get very attached, unfortunately, to the work we do as opposed to the people that we are. And it sounds like that really. Um, you know, came to fruition with all of the psychologists with their incredible degrees. And, 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 you know, I'm sure a lot of them really are wonderful and very knowledgeable, but you know, that attachment to this is who I am, you know, anyone that says that you're not that person or that who you are is bad can be deeply 
deeply troubling for, for the soul, I think. What, what do you think about that idea that um, self-development is in large part that idea of rediscovering discovering the truth of who you are? I'm going to link that into um, something that's really come through in the last couple of years. And we're talking about psychologists in the room and everything. I th- I've just had some, I've just filmed some clients telling their stories and put them on my website. And the thing that comes through them is that they've all, and this isn't just them, this is nearly every client that sees me, is they've all been to a psychologist, um, but they don't feel that rapport with them because the psychologist hasn't gone through it. They're not living and breathing it. It's not genuine and authentic. They're just, you know, going off what they studied and learnt and the diploma on their wall, the degree on the wall says, I can learn stuff. Mm. Um, and Aaron Ram Das lecture, I was listening to yesterday, he says how we've put intellect up on a pedestal instead of wisdom. And you, you, we a, a lot of... I'm not having a crack at psychology, but it's so young compared to Buddhist and Stoic philosophy. Um, and there are there are great psychologists out there, and there are shit psychologists out there. So I'm, I'm not cracking or, or having a pot shot at anyone, but this is just based purely off what my clients tell me. Um, is that yeah, there's not that rapport there, and and these these people that are in a position of of helping and healing. Uh, aren't developed enough within themselves to fully understand what they're talking about. Like they haven't done the work on themselves. And so, you know, the suicide rate in psychologists is very high um, because a lot of them haven't done the work. So I think there's a big shift now in, in going to say lived experience practitioners, you know, those of us that have been to the school of life and then gone on and, and studied and um, got a foot in both camps rather than sitting there going, right, well, whose fault is it? This is what you should do. Freud said this. You know, I've read this in a book and I'm going to now tell you. We're going to turn that knowledge into wisdom through application. And that's where a lot of people fall down is, is they accumulate knowledge. They accumulate this intellect and they'll go and tell all these people about it. I say to my clients, you are not allowed to talk to anyone about this shit until you're practicing it yourself, until you're living it and breathing mm. it. You can't go and tell people what to do. You can't just look at a quote and then say to someone, oh, the source of all pain is attachment. Well, you <laughs> remain deeply attached to everything. Yeah, It's just, it's just not going to work. You've got to turn the knowledge into wisdom through application yeah i definitely don't disagree with anything that you just said there mate um absolutely true absolutely true and uh the truth will out and i think what's so good about the internet is that it's breaking down a lot of those very old outdated um socially egotistical walls i think which is which is really good um if you think about who you were when you like day one you know, when you first started this journey, perhaps then you didn't even know that you were about to embark upon a journey. You know, you just... Which, which, which journey? This, this incarnation of life or... Good question. Or journey? <laughs> That's a very good question. Your, your specific incarnation, um, you know, still Sorry, very much... Born. So, okay. When you, from, from day one, post your deepest pain in this life to uh, uh-huh. so straight after the military experience... Um, given what you know now to help kind of like guide that young fella, um, Mm. what, what kind of wisdom would you, would you um, take him through and what would you tell him to do? Um, The the only word that comes to mind is trust. That's, that's just, just trust that you're going to be okay. And trust that I think trust for me, thinking about it now, um, uh, speaks of that impermanence. Trust that trust that this isn't going to last. That that this isn't this isn't who you are. This isn't going to define you. This this pain you're experiencing is impermanent. It's going to go away. Trust that you you're going to be okay. And that's what I find with many clients is that um, they don't trust themselves because. I don't know why, just, just they don't. But I, my counsellor, um, you know, who I still go and see, just 
on a regular basis just because I love having a chat with them. It's a bit of a weird unit and we, we have good conversation. There's, there's nothing, no problems. It's just like having someone run an air over me mm. uh, as I do my clients. He said to me one day, he goes, Nick, you, you're a weirdo. And I'm glad he didn't stop there. Uh, <laughs> he, yep. said, he said, you're very unique in the fact that you trust the seaworthiness of your own ship. Ooh, nice. And I could not understand what the fuck he was talking about until I played around with it for a few hours later. And then what I realized was, you know that expression, a ship is safe in harbor, but that's not what ships are built for. I'd spent all of my time post day one, as you were talking about earlier, to to going, then going to see the psychologist. Um, I'd spent all of that time in my comfort zone and just, I wasn't even sailing around my harbour. I was anchored down, growing barnacles, timber was rotting, sails were, un, you know, it was just a mess. Rope was green. It was just a shambles. <laughs> and, and because I was so afraid of going out there. So when, when I finally cleaned myself up and got back in shape, I, I was like, fucking everything I want is on the other side of this this pain everything i want is on the other side of this fear and that's mm. what it was it was all fear so i just jumped in my ship and went straight out the harbor straight through that barrier of fear and i was like this is where life is this is where you're alive like so many people want utopia they want the smooth sailing they, they want a relationship where they wake up and kiss each other every morning and hug and you know just uh, there's no disruptions there's no disturbances but you need those waves, you know, it's because that's where you have to dig deep and that's where your character is revealed and that's where you have to learn. That's where your growth lies in, in all that stuff. So I don't go actively looking for storms or trying to make storms now, but when the storms inevitably roll in, I'm like, all right, strap yourselves in. Here we go behind the wheel. And I'm like, bring it on. Cause if, if in the past I used to go and hide, you know, in the, uh, under the deck of the ship and, and, I uh, just hope and wish and want and pray that I was going to come out of this okay. And that's that's so disempowering. That's this so, I'm, I'm just, I'm not even living. Uh, that's the survival mode. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was great for me personally to, to realise that everything you want is on the other side of that fear, that discomfort precedes the success. And, and now I, I jump in the deep end and, you know, I've gone from not being able to leave my house to now working at a world leading um, international health resort in Thailand as a visiting practitioner. Uh, I've got you know, the past version of it. Going, I've got no rights being there. I've got, you know, <laughs> I've got who the fuck am I to, to be there and being charged out at 500 bucks a US an hour? Like that's just, that's, uh, you know, and I laugh at the hilarity of it. The, just the beauty of it because I wouldn't have done it if I had have had that fear and those attachments and everything. I just, I just trusted it. a client actually said when I was moving to Thailand, she goes, Oh yeah, I'll go to this resort. It's where you're living. You'd be great there. You should apply. And I was just like, Oh, I sent them an email and I've got this philosophy now of, of working with the universe uh, and meeting it halfway. I'm, I'm just trying to live as slowly as possible. Mm. So I'm just like, all right, I'll put it out there and I'm not going to attach to a desired outcome. I'm just going to let the universe tell me if this is the path I'm meant to be on or not. So I sent, sent Shiva some a message and they said, yep, come in and have a chat. We worked and now I've been back, you know, five or six times. I go there twice a year, so met some amazing clients. Uh, all because I just went, fuck it, see what happens. Um, uh, what's that dude that owns Virgin, Richard Branson? I think he said, if someone asks you to do something, you say yes and then figure it out later. Yeah. And and that to me is trust. So coming full circle back to your question, the advice I'd give to myself is just to, to keep trusting that it's going to be okay because it's, it's meant to be, you know. It's... Um, I don't, I don't think anything is a coincidence or an accident or anything like that. It's, I don't know, it's beyond me, beyond my consciousness. It's, it's all part of a bigger picture, I think. Mm, mm. Nick, where can people find you? Well, I don't exist. So <laughs> You're uh, very hard to interview, mate. 
<laughs> You're not even here right now. <laughs> oh, well, uh, have you seen uh, that Ram Dust thing on Films for Change website? It's um, becoming nobody. It's, uh, yes. For anyone, for anyone listening, yeah, great, great little video. Um, mm. uh, you can find me. I've, I've been off social media for a month, so that's okay. been great. Yeah, um, that's beautiful. Yeah, so you can you can call me on on the the telephone. Um, uh, just jump on my website, mindfit m y n d f i t dot com dot uh, You can shoot me an email, hello at mindfit dot com dot au. Uh, yeah, my numbers on there. Uh, access me through the social media. Someone will you know, tell me that there's a message there. Um, uh, jump on the Woke Blokes podcast and you know, listen to the shit we ramble on about there, and send us a message through that if you want to. Uh, I don't know, man. It's just when the when the students are ready, the teacher will come, and, mm. and so that's you know people people just find me when they're they're meant to when they're ready to. So, and uh, what's the weirdest thing about you, mate? That only your counsellor seems to know, but you can now let us all know about it. <laughs> oh Jesus! Uh, if you can name one. Weirdest, you can name one. <laughs> weirdest thing about me. Uh, I'm just probably on a different planet a lot of the time. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't. I don't feel human a lot of the time. I observe so much. You know, it's it's being present and observing it really does create a different reality for you. Um, so I'm not bouncing between the past and the future anymore. I'm just pretty pretty present. Uh, it took me 20 minutes to eat an orange once in the, in the Vipassana meditation because wow. uh, I was so high like vibrating I was so high and I was just experiencing and I was like pulled it apart and I'm like oh my god there's tubes of juice and that tube of juice is so sweet <laughs> but the rind is so sour but together they're amazing <laughs> and you know I, you can't ex- I can't exist in that high all the time because I want to be connected to, to people here but um, I love I love that shit. So I don't know, man. I'm just the weirdest thing about me is I don't know. Uh, it's up to people to tell me what they find weird because everyone's going to have a different perception. That uh, experience with an orange sounds uh, a lot like when I used to do mushrooms, mate. So <laughs> <laughs> what what do you think the weirdest thing about me is, Tom? From from your Ooh. knowledge of me. The weirdest thing about you. Um, well, I mean, I see. I like weird. People think weird is bad. I really like weird. Um, so I'm interested, I'm interested as to why you chose the word weird. Yeah. Well, no, the only reason I chose the word weird is because you mentioned, but I always try to finish the con finish the podcast with like some kind of question, like a funny uh, little yeah, thing yeah. to finish it off. And Cause I said my counselor said, I'm cause you said your counselor thinks you're weird. That's why I thought I'd just throw it in there. Sometimes it's people, you know, Oh, you know, what would you say to, you know, yourself in day one or what would you say? Yada, yada, yada. But I was just like, I'm interested why your counselor thinks you're weird. So I was like, I wonder what that was. Well, yeah, it's, it's because I trust myself completely. Yes. I know that I'm going to be okay, whatever happens. Uh, I'm Maybe that, that is quite weird. Not a, people, not a whole lot of people do that, dude. <laughs> yeah, no, they don't, man. And it, it still baffles me every time I see it. For yeah. Some reason. I, I know how prevalent it is, but I still, I'm still so curious as to, I'm like, that's so interesting. People don't trust themselves. I know, I know. Yeah, absolutely, man. Mate, it, it's um, I know you've got to get out, get out of here. So it, it is a real pleasure to have you on the show. This won't be the um first and only time, and um, just want to express my gratitude to you, mate. I, I loved um our show together on the Woke Blokes podcast, and um, I think it's akin to what you were saying before about flowing with things that that come to you um it was uh it was really great to meet you and i always knew we'd we'd have lots to talk about so there'll be there'll be many hours still to come i'm sure i i look forward to each and every one of those hours i'm equally as grateful for um yeah coming into contact with you and having you on our podcast and me on your podcast and even doing the breath work with Siobhan. Mm. Fuck, isn't that a head trip? Jeez, yeah. I had a one-on-one with her the other week and I have no idea where I went, man, but that, yeah. was, that, that was a trip. So, um, but uh, oh yeah, I, I think it's an example. All of this happened so organically and, and I was meant to meet Ryan. I was meant to meet you and Siobhan and it's just, I love the, I love the, I love the work that we're all doing. Mm, yeah, no, absolutely, mate. It's good. It's it's very, it's very connected. So, 
For sure. You know, hopefully when um, all this COVID stuff goes well, I'll actually be able to give you a hug again as opposed to just, uh, oh, you know, shaking oh. your hand over the internet. <laughs> oh, I'm hanging for some more hugs, man. I'm a big no. hugger and it's, uh, I've been on a hug, hug drought. So, uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Mate, pleasure. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks very much, buddy. Thank you, sir. Good man. Nice. Nice. That was good. That was good. Yeah. Hopefully your, 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 your man doesn't have a problem cutting it all together. Yeah, I know. He'll, uh, he'll have his work cut out for him, but he's good. He's, he's good. So I might even have to go back and have a listen to it as well. Not that I don't trust him, but I think um, it'd just be funny to see like how he kind of works in the, the stops, you know? Yeah. yeah It'll be good. have to do some gap fillers or something. Just maybe, maybe you might have to record it. Oh, we had a technical issue. Um, we're back and then move on yeah exactly exactly no but i think the content was great mate so he'll he'll be able to cut it up and um i can send some some stuff to you as well he, he puts it all on 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 youtube and all the instagram stuff but um okay. if you want any of it i'll i'll punch it through and yeah man just whatever just um yeah and i'll get someone to share it on my social medias and uh yeah just that was great i love it yeah, loved love chatting. Great questions. Great, I just I love the organicness of it and goes where it needs to. So hopefully, listeners get some value out of it. Yeah, yeah, for sh- for sure, mate. I, like I, I really um, want to always do the organic and the canvas because it forces me to listen to every guest, you know, and like all and and what that means, obviously, to learn from every guest. It's like if I have another question here, I'm like, oh, great, thanks for you answer there nick all right well let me move on and it's just like <laughs> yeah moving right along yeah i've got to listen and yeah because i was so bad at, at that for so long you know um yeah but uh no nah, it's great mate dude we'll do it again uh for sure you've got to get out of here i know um i yeah, will good. speak to you um very shortly yeah i'll let us know when you and me and Hass on together and we'll, oh yes we'll, yes definitely we'll, we'll have the, we'll have the menage a trois very good <laughs> all right mate i'll talk to you soon all right see you bud